with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. These are doctrines of devils. These doctrines of devils are preached today everywhere. This melting pot, this molding together of churches today, of, of different movements to come together and to be one is very popular. I mean, if you can unify with people, if you can, if you can shake hands with people, if you, can, if you can, of other denominations, man, I'm telling you, if you can have that ecumenical spirit, then people love that today. If you'll cross those ecumenical lines and you'll be that way, I'm telling you, you'll have a lot of fans, you'll have a lot of money, you'll have a lot of power, you'll have a lot of prestige, and people will love you. The problem is it's not biblical. The Holy Ghost warns us here of the apostasy. Notice how he says here, the Spirit speaketh expressly. That means that he is speaking with boldness, and it means with force and clarity and clearness. God is not leaving you in the dark that in these last times, there will be these people that come, these preachers that come, these prophets that come, and they will come to deceive many. Jude says there are certain men that have crept in unawares. He says in, in verse number four, he says, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. These people are getting very popular. These men are getting very fat and rich off of the people of God. And Billy Graham is one that made his money and made his fortune and made his, made his popularity off of the money in the backs of fundamentalists. And he did it in the most way you could possibly do it. The quotes and everything that I'm going to show you tonight, this man did this under the guise of being a true Bible preacher when all along he was not. He was not true to what he said he was. He did not believe what the Bible said about salvation, and I, I'm going to show you that here tonight. He said one thing, but he practiced another. Now, that's not to say that nobody ever got didn't get saved out of Billy Graham's ministry. Of course people got saved. I mean, people get saved whether Christ is preached in pretense, or however, uh, we rejoice because Christ is preached. That's true. Nonetheless, they got saved by the, by the true seed, the incorruptible seed, the Word of God, that which liveth and abideth forever. Amen? They didn't get saved from him, uh, from just what he did. And, and Billy Graham was, was the king of the so showmanships and everything else. And we're going to show you that tonight here. He was the king of doing all that. You know, it, it's, it's very interesting when you start looking at this. But uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 3, we're also warned, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So Paul was very clear to young Timothy. He was warning him. Don't you find it interesting, Brother Paul, that these are in the, what's called the pastoral epistles, that these warnings about the end times and warnings about false teachers and warnings of, and the Spirit of God warning young preachers, listen, you better be alert. You better understand what's going on. The Spirit speaketh expressly, clearly to you, with force and with gravity, that, that some shall depart from the faith. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And one thing that these people all have in line, all the same, one message they have all the same is each, each one of them, whether it's Joel Olstein we'll talk about uh, sometime in the near future, Rick Warren, who's done more damage, not as much as Billy Graham, but he's done a whole lot of damage, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, and, and uh, Billy Graham, and these other men have done a lot of damage. But they all preach doctrines of devils. They don't preach the gospel like it's written in the scriptures, and they certainly don't follow through like the scriptures say. I've met people, you say, this can't be a problem. Oh, it is a problem, especially in Minnesota. People love Billy Graham here. Man, I have some good friends that, when I, when I start telling them about Billy Graham and tell them the truth about it, I mean, and the fact that he was, listen to me, I have no respect for any preacher who shakes hands with the, popes and kiss, co, the Pope and kisses his pinky finger, okay? I've got no respect for that man. That makes me want to vomit. I, if I seen that guy, I'd want to puke on his shoes, okay? Billy Graham, yeah, 
Yeah, I know. You can say what you want to, but I want to puke on his shoes, okay? Because it, 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 it's disgusting. It's absolutely... He shook hands with a devil. He put his ministry under a devil. You know, it used to be that Baptists used to take a strong line against Rome. Now you have, man, I want to say it was the, was it the head of the North American Baptist that did something this week with the Pope? He, he went over to meet the Pope. Yeah, of the North American Baptist, he went over to meet the Pope. Do you realize how absolutely evil the papacy is? How absolutely evil it is. Mm, I gotta get moving. All right. These people are dangerous. It says here, Paul Paul warns young Timothy, he says here, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Why is that? Because they speak what they, they give it they, they have the form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. What they, they they give you the impression, these 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 prophets of the new order, these prophets of the new world order, what they're doing is and, and that really the, of the one world listen, the one world religion and the political system are all gonna be one, just so you understand that. They're all gonna be one one day. What these people give the impression of these men is, is that they are preaching the Bible. They're preaching Jesus Christ. But the Jesus that Billy Graham preaches is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus that Rick Warren preaches is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus that Joel Olstein, I don't know where he got his at. It's way far out there. I mean, it's, it's the Jesus you'll find that these men are preaching are Masonic. It's a Masonic Jesus. It's not the one found in the scriptures at all. And you'd be surprised the people that are influenced by these men. You'd be shocked. There are churches in Minnesota that have been ripped apart, Baptist churches, by Rick Warren's book. We're going to talk about Rick tonight. But, uh, but the methods of Billy Graham and everything else, you, you'd be surprised. By the way, most fu many fundamentalists today practice nearly the same methods of evangelism as Billy Graham did. If you watch the way that they lead people to the Lord, so to speak, and the things that they do, you, you can see clearly what they're doing, what they're all about. On the one hand, these men, they, they, they preach the fundamentals in theory and, and on, a, on a doctoral statement, but behind the scenes, it's completely different. Well, who is this Billy Graham then? Who is he? And, and how did he start? And how did these men creep in? What these men do, by the way, this is a Jesuit plan. You say, that sounds really conspiratorial. Well, it is. <laughs> it is, because Rome's evil. Amen. Listen, I, I heard a politician here this week, Rand Paul, say what, what President Barack Obama should say to the Pope when he goes and meets him. I, I, I wouldn't go meet the Pope if I was a president. I wouldn't. I would not go meet the Pope. I would, as a preacher, I would never go meet the Pope. As a Christian, I would never go meet the Pope. And does it strike you as odd that the Pope doesn't love fire, pre, uh, fire, hell, damnation preaching street preachers and 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 old-fashioned Baptists and Anabaptist preachers that he can't stand them, but he likes a guy like Billy Graham? So why do why do Christians? Look to Billy Graham and adore him. What happened to him and what was he all about? I'm going to read you some things that are from, a lot of this is from his biography, so you get an understanding. I like to take their own words and use their own words. So say, You just made that up. No, I'm using their own words of what they said. Billy Graham traces his conversion to the preaching of evangelist Mordecai Ham. In 1934, he graduated from high school in May of 1936 and attended Bob Jones University which uh, in the fall, but switched to Florida Bible Institute after only one semester because he did not like the strict discipline at Bob Jones. <laughs> he notes in his biography that one thing that thrilled me about Florida Bible Institute was the diversity of viewpoints we were exposed to in the classroom. A wondrous blend of ecumenical and evangelical thought that was really ahead of its time. 
You know what he's saying, don't you? He got to merge with Rome, Roman doctrine. He got to merge those things together in an ecumenical fashion. During Graham's 1949 Los Angeles crusade, his ministry began to receive national press coverage. Graham's final rift with the most fundamentalist leaders did not occur until 1957, though. This was brought about by the open sponsorship of the Liberal Protestant Church Council in New York City. The Graham Crusade Committee in New York in, included 120 theological modernists who denied the infallibility of Scripture. So Billy is supposed to be a fundamentalist, and Billy is hanging out with all the modernists. He's getting all of his money from the fundamentalist, but he's using that money to build up a relationship with the modernist. The wife of modernist Norman Vincent Peale headed up the women's prayer groups for the crusade. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> Modernists like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. sat on the platform and led in prayer. In the National Observer in 1963, King said the virgin birth of Christ was a mythological story created by early Christians. In Ebony Magazine in January of 1961, King said, I do not believe in hell as a place of literal burning fire. End quote. Well, you're there now. And you're burning there now, because it's real. But see, Billy linked himself up right away, who I believe was his Jesuit handler, okay, from Rome. A man that handled him, and one of the, that was one of his good friends, was Fulton Sheen. You ever heard of Fulton Sheen? Sheen, Fulton Sheen, when, when Sheen died in December of 1979, he was a bishop, by the way, uh, Graham testified that he had known him as a friend for over 35 years. Sheen was a faithful son of Rome. In his book, Treasure in Clay, Sheen said that one of his spiritual secrets was to offer Mass every Saturday in honor of the Blessed Mother to solicit her protection of my priesthood. Sheen devoted an entire chapter of his biography to Mary, the woman I love, he said. Man. When I was ordained, I took a resolution to offer the holy sacrifice of the Eucharist every Saturday to the Blessed Mother. All this makes me very certain that when I go before the judgment seat of Christ, he will say to me in his mercy, I heard my mother speak of you. That's Fulton Sheen. That was Billy's good friend for 35 years. I, I'm just curious. Do you think that I could be really good friends and hang out with a Roman Catholic priest? Do you think that would happen? Do you think he'd come listen to me preach? Do you think that would happen? Maybe to put a bullet in my head. Maybe for that reason. Oh, come on. Rome's not that bad. Oh, yeah, they are. That bad and then some. And then some. You have no idea the control that the Roman Catholic Church has outside of America. Now, inside they have plenty, but outside of America in poor countries, you have no idea. No idea what kind of power they have. Okay, so Billy says that, or not Billy, but Fulton Sheen, Billy's good buddy, says that, you know, he'd be fine because Jesus is gonna, was going to say to him at the judgment seat, I heard my mother speak of you. Because, you know, Jesus couldn't hear Fulton Sheen speak. He had to hear it through Mary. You understand? During my life, I have made about 30 pilgr pilgrimages to the shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes and about 10 to her shrine in Fatima. So Billy had a love for Rome in the beginning. I mean, he had a love right, right in the beginning. But everybody thought that Billy Graham was this great fundamentalist, He's a, he was from the Southern Baptist Convention, which is full of Masons, by the way. Um, anyway, we talked about, here's what Billy said the first time he met Fulton Sheen. We talked about our ministries and our common commitment to evangelism. And I told him how grateful I was for his ministry and his focus on Christ. Well, his focus on Christ, he just gave all the glory to Mary for everything. We talked further, and we prayed, and by the time he left, I felt as if I had known him all my life. Do you think, I, do you, do you think that could happen with a, with, a, with a Baptist preacher that preached that Bible, that King James Bible? 
Could him and Fulton Sheen sit down like that? No, I don't think so. When Graham met Sheen in 1944, it was three years before his first citywide crusade. Graham had started preaching for Youth for Christ in 1944 and was an unknown young man. Why would a Catholic leader as famous as Fulton Sheen go out of his way to befriend an insignificant young fundamental Baptist preacher like Billy Graham? Graham was only eight years out of high school at the time. By the way, there's much evidence to, to, that is submitted that Billy Graham is a 33rd degree Mason as well. There's a lot of that evidence that's out there. You can, you can search that out yourself. Whether that's true or not, I, I believe it is. I believe he had Jesuit activities in Rome. By the way, he was, he was, he was given a degree by the Jesuit college. Yeah, he said it was the greatest honor of his life to be given a Jesuit degree. Yeah. He, Billy went on to assure John, John R. Rice and Bob Jones Sr. that he was a fundamentalist. Graham was also knighted by the Queen of England. If you understand anything about the Illuminati and the one world government, you'll understand what that meant. Think about it. Another significant thing happened in the early 1950s in Boston. Cardinal Cushing, in his magazine, The Pilot, put Bravo Billy on the front cover. That made news all over the country. He and I became close, wonderful friends. That was my first real coming to grips with the whole Protestant Catholic situation. I began to realize that there were Christians everywhere. They might be called modernist Catholics or whatever, but they were Christians. No, they're not. They're deceived. He would also call on the local Catholic bishop or other clerics to acquaint them with crusade plans and invite them to the meetings. They would usually appoint a priest to attend and report back. Do you understand this? This was back in the 50s. He was having Catholic priests, come, he was inviting them to his crusades, and they would come there and they would report back to Rome and to their diocese or whatever how things were going there. All the meanwhile, Billy is telling everybody he's a fundamentalist. You know why he said he said this was years before the Vatican II's openness to Protestants. But we were concerned to let the Catholic bishops see that my goal was not to get people to leave their church. Rather, I wanted them to commit their lives to Christ. And let me explain to you my goal. My goal is for them to leave that great whore and to get out of it and get saved by the grace of God. That's my goal. Make no mistake about it. I had a one time, this is funny, one time we, had a, uh, we were going to rent a building uh, from a, a Catholic building over in, we were trying to get them to sell it, but they wouldn't sell it or whatever. I don't remember what it was. But anyway, we were going to rent it, you know, but and use this building, right, because it was vacant. They weren't using it anymore. It was just sitting there. Well, I met with this Catholic father here that, that uh, Father O'Malley or whatever his name was, and, uh, and, and I met with him and I sat down with him and he said to me, he said, well, you know, the only concern that I have is that uh, this building isn't used to, uh, to bash Catholics, to bash, <laughs> bash Roman Catholicism. And I'm like, well, I mean, pretty much, I mean, I can't, everything I say is going to be against what you believe. Yeah, I mean everything. I mean pretty much. I mean everything. I couldn't sign a piece of paper. It was like they wanted me to sign a piece of paper saying that I wouldn't like bash Rome. I was like, well, I'm a Baptist. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I like live to bash Rome. I mean, I that's I just it just comes out of my blood Amen. to bash Rome. It's part of who I am. How could I do that? I, I went back and said I can't do that. And I sat with that. Well, we just don't want you doing this and that. I'm like, yeah, okay. So we walked away from that. God didn't let me do, get anywhere near that. He just got me away from it, you know. But I mean, I was like, I I can't really. I mean, really? I mean, how, like, how am I gonna not? I mean, all the weird. And he was walking through the building. The buildings are spooky, by the way. That's what it was. They didn't want me proselytizing everybody. And I won't, we'll, we'll, we'll baptize them, not proselytize <laughs> But anyway, um, I, I couldn't, I, there was nothing I could do there. I, come on, am I really going to sign a piece of paper saying I'm not going to preach against Rome? Please. That would never happen. So it didn't. So we didn't take the building. But. And then they put in a Pentecostal. There's a Pentecostal church in there now. And they, they're fine with it. They're all the same spirit, so they get along good. 
In the 1940s and 50s, Billy Graham admits in his biography to yoking up with the Romans, the Unitarians, and the Evangelicals. He said he found a way to get them all together. He said, man, I, can get the, I got the Catholics, I got the Unitarians, and I got the Evangelicals, and we're all shaking hands together, all singing Kumbaya together. Brother Paul was singing that tonight. You tell me why a man that is an evangelist would yoke with Rome and bridge the Protestant churches back to Rome. Think about it. Graham stated this, the particular problem I was struggling with for the first time since I was a teenager was the inspiration and authority of the scriptures. He said, I, you, you kidding me? This guy is saying, I don't even, I don't even think it's, it's a word of God. I mean, I'm struggling with that. How do you struggle with the fact that you're preaching the Bible? How do you struggle with the fact this is the authority? Wow. Billy Graham said in his time there, he said the greatest theologians of, the, of today are Rudolf Boltman, Karl Barth, Paul Tillich, and Carl Henry. Now only one of those are even a Bible, believe the Bible is God's word. The rest of them didn't even believe it. They didn't believe that was God's word. But I want you to understand, you say, why do we have to talk about this? I want you to understand something, that all the while he is claiming to be a fundamentalist, and people are believing him. They believe it. They still believe it today. You can try to show these people evidence of it. And Billy Graham is used for nothing more than bridging the gap back to Rome. That is all that he was there to do. To have that spirit of Antichrist where doctrine means nothing and hey, just say it in Jesus' name and everything's fine. Well, it's not the Jesus, it's in the Bible. And I'm going to show you that he did not believe, he does not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. Another man that needs to be looked at is William Randolph Hearst. He was a publisher who had the San Francisco Examiner, Los Angeles Examiner, Boston Sunday Advertiser. Listen, this guy had like a ton of magazines he was, or a ton of newspapers. He was a huge, huge newspaper man. I mean, the big, one of the biggest in the country. By the way, he was a 33rd degree mason as well. And he said this. He sent out a memo to all 400 of his newspapers or whatever, how many ever he had across the country. And he said... Puff Billy. He said, Puff Billy. Yeah, Puff him. What does that mean? Push him out in front of everybody. Get his name in everywhere. Put it in every newspaper. Put it in everything you can find. Advertise it everywhere. Push his campaign. He also funded Billy Graham's crusades. Now, why would this man... Why would this man want to fund Billy Graham? Why would he want to puff him and push him in front of everyone? Why would he want to do that? Does that happen? Is that common today? Do you think preachers that preach the word of God that newspaper men want to push that? It's not common, is it? Never has been. Has God's word ever been popular with the world? Why is it when Billy does it? Why does everybody like it when Billy does it? Interesting, isn't it? Graham writes in his autobiography about that event in 1949. He says this. He states, When I arrived at the tent for the next meeting, the scene startled me. For the first time, the place was crawling with reporters and photos. Photogra photographers. They had taken almost no notice of the meeting up until now, and very little had appeared in the papers. I asked one of the journalists what was happening. He said, you've been kissed by William Randolph Hearst, he responded. We don't want Jesus Christ to give us that, right? We, we want some worldly man. He said, I have no idea what the reporter was talking about. Although I knew the name, Hearst, of course, was the great newspaper owner. I had never met the man, but like most Americans, I had read his papers. The next morning's headline story was the campaign in Los Angeles Examiner, followed by an evening story in the Los Angeles Herald Express, both owned by Hearst, stunned me. The story was picked up by Hearst papers in New York, Chicago, Detroit, San Francisco, and then all by, by all their competitors. Until then, I doubt if any newspaper editor outside the area had heard of our Los Angeles campaign. Supposed, in fact, the night before the rally, an editorial written by Hearst said, of all great assemblies to take place in Los Angeles area this year, none perhaps will be more significant 
and with more far-reaching effects than the Billy Graham rally in the Pasadena Rose Bowl tomorrow evening. How did Hearst know that? How did he know that? When the bookstore journal asked Graham in 1991, what has been the highlight of your ministry so far? He responded this, I always think my most recent crusade is the highlight, but there have certainly been high points. One was our meeting in Los Angeles in 1949. We were supposed to be there three weeks, but we stayed for eight or ten. Mr. Hurst, the publisher, became interested in the meetings. How, I do not know. Before his involvement, we did not get any coverage at all. Then all of a sudden, we were on the front page of both of the Hearst local papers every day, and we were in all the papers across the country, of course, and other pagan, pa pagans. <laughs> Sorry, papers. I had to pay attention then. Why does the news love Billy Graham? By the way, who the William Randolph Hearst Foundation in 1984 gave $10,000 to Planned Parenthood. Also funded in part by the Hearst Corporation was the Pulitzer Prize winning play called Angels in America, a gay fantasia or national themes which was held in St. John the Divine Cathedral about 1994. Hmm. Let us pray, God, a cure would be nice. Enlighten the un unenlightened, the Pope, the Cardinals, Archbishops and Priests, even John O'Connor, Teach him how Christ's kindness worked. Remind him he's forgotten. Make them all remember. Replace the ice water in their veins with the blood of Christ. Let it pound in their temples. Your silence, I must tell you, so steadfastly maintained, even in the face of our appalling need, is outrageous. So many have died this year alone in case you were absent, God, or absent-minded. Where, where, God, are you? That's how they're talking to God. A few other sponsors of the Blasphemous Play it goes on and, and explains. The Rockefellers, obviously, you know, the Rothschilds. Hmm, wonder how they got involved with that. That's weird. The background is more important to understand what these people are, Bob, or who these people are, especially Billy Graham. Bob Jones, and Billy, Bob Jones said this of Billy Graham, that he has done more harm to the cause of Christ than any other man. Yeah, senior, yeah. Than any other man. By the way, Billy Graham preaches an antinomian heresy. You can see that in his actions by when he sends people back to the Roman Catholic Church, which you will see here. In 1948, Billy Graham, still being a little fiery, when asked what would happen at the World Council of Churches, he said, I think they will nominate the Antichrist. Pretty powerful. He's that or he's just tipping his hand and he really didn't disprove of it. But... Um, but then as early as 1961, he was attending the World Council of Churches. See how money and influence and Rome's attention changed, well, revealed who he really was? Put it that way. In 1974, he said, I have nothing but the warmest of relations with the World Council of Churches. That's sick. Billy Graham did not just recently go bad. He was full of deceit since 1950. In his, in his, autobiog in his biography, Just As I Am, in, on page 162, he said this. He would also call on the, on the local Catholic bishops. We would also call on the local Catholic bishops and other clerics to acquaint them with the crusade plans and invite them to the meetings. Could you imagine calling up, could you imagine calling up local Catholic bishops and saying, hey, would you bring some, come on out and bring some folks with you to our meeting? Yeah, come on out to work the to work the crowd. Yeah, they would usually appoint a priest to attend and report back. This was years before Vatican II. Even the worst of Graham's betrayals involved John R. Rice of the Sword of the Lord Publications in 1955. Rice flew to Scotland and took part in a crusade with Graham. Billy told the elder evangelist, "Quote." I have promised God I will never have on my committee working in any active way in any of my campaigns men who do not believe in the virgin birth of Christ, who do not believe in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, and who do not believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. These men will never be on my committee. I have promised God. Billy lied to God. Because he did. 
Billy promised God and then lied to God. He also lied, lied to Bob Jones Sr., Bob Jones Jr., R.T. Ketchum, Jack Warston, and John R. Rice. In 1957, he said this, Anyone who makes a decision in our meetings is seen later and referred to a local clergyman, Protestant, Catholic, or Jewish. Are you getting this? Protestant, Catholic, or Jewish? Do you know I have talked to fundamentalists in this state right here in Baptist churches who have told me that Billy Graham is a good guy. He preached some good stuff. Yeah, but look at the whole of what he did. He said one thing, but if you listen to what he said, he really wasn't preaching Bible. He denies the Bible. By the way, in 1967, Billy received an honorary degree from a Roman Jesuit school. We'll get to that in a little while. Billy denies the Bible. In this, he says this, In this paradise that God had built concerning Genesis chapter 1, called the Garden of Eden, you can take it symbolically, you can take it literally, it makes no difference as far as the truth and meaning is concerned. So the Genesis account, oh, you can take it you know, figuratively if you want to. I mean, you can take it literally. It's no big deal, whichever way. Really? That was in 1978 in McCall Magazine. I, I encourage you to check this out and look yourself. By the way, when, he, when his, his information is going to be blasted everywhere, I mean, it, they're going to use it to their advantage. He said, I used to think that pagans in far-off countries were lost. We're going to hell if they did not have the gospel preached to them. I no longer believe that. I believe there are other ways of recognizing the existence of God through nature, for instance, and plant and plant of other opportunities, therefore of saying yes to God. He says you can see God in nature. You can see God's hand in nature, I won't deny that. But do you understand what he's saying is basically if you believe in the existence of a God, then that's, gonna, that's enough. No, that's Masonic language. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. In the following video on May 31st, 1997, on the Hour of Power television program titled Say Yes to Possibility Thinking, and I can't stand Robert Schuler. he makes me sick. Robert Schuler interviewed Billy Graham. What Billy Graham said in the video is alarming. He said, I think that I think everybody that, that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. Now, how could somebody not, not know Christ consciously? I mean, they know by osmosis? or I mean, I, mean, I don't get it. What does that mean? I mean? They have a Christ conscience? Is that what he's saying? They, they, just, they, 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 they don't really realize they're in the body. Oh, you, God tricked them and they're really in the body of Christ and you didn't know about it. Okay, I see. Yeah, he kind of they just tricked them. They didn't know, but they're in there. Listen to this. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people out of the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. They are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have. And I think that they are saved, that they are going to be with us in heaven. End quote. That's Masonic language. That's cult language. It's not Bible. What did Jesus say very clearly? But there are people that pick up on Billy Graham. They're involved with the Billy Graham uh, revival uh, societies and associations and all those other things. And they, you, you would be shocked if you knew how many Baptists support that and send money into that still to this day. Send money to, to that Billy Graham uh, society or whatever they call it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yep, Evangelist Association. Schuler goes on to say, that's wonderful. I'm glad to hear you say that. 
There's a wideness in God's mercy. <laughs> what a fool. That guy's gotten rich off of people. Do you understand how bad these people have hurt others? Do you understand that their work is still carried on today? And all Billy Graham is is a prophet of the New World Order. He's a prophet of the New Church. He's a prophet of the New Age Church. That's all that he is. They're trying to make a one world church. They're trying to bring it all together. And that's exactly what Billy Graham's job was to do. And he did it. And it worked. But Jesus Christ said, narrow is the way. Amen? Narrow is the way. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. What did Jesus say about that? I'm going to listen to Jesus before I listen to Billy. Or Robert Schuller, by the way. Ugh. Bunch of heretics. Jesus said, Enter ye into the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Don't you like that, how Robert Schuller said, there's a wideness, and what did Jesus say about this? Yeah, he said he's a wolf. He says, enter ye into the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. They're, they're preaching the opposite. See that? They're preaching the wideness. There is no wideness. It's narrow. It always has been narrow, and it always will be narrow. Narrow is the way. Amen. Billy Graham said this, I used to play God, but I can't do that anymore. I used to believe that pagans in far-off countries were lost, were going to hell. If they did not have the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to them, I no longer believe that. I believe that there are other ways of recognizing the existence of God through nature, for instance, and plenty of other opportunities, therefore of saying yes to God. I can't play God anymore. By the way, that was 1978 when he said that. The, the time he said it with Robert Schuller was in the 90s. Billy always believed that. He just lied. Larry King asked Billy Graham, what about Jews and Muslims? I can't judge them. I can't judge them, he said. Well, let me ask you a question, friend. What if somebody, what if a Jew or a Muslim asked you? Would you, t would you look at them and tell them, I can't judge them? How can you even evangelize if you looked at somebody and told them you couldn't judge them? If they were a Jew or a Muslim or, or they believed in a cult or they were a Mormon or whatever, or JW or whatever, how could you look? Well, I can't judge you. The Word of God judges. Jesus came. Jesus is the judge. Jesus said. If you believe not that I am he, you shall all likewise perish. That was what Jesus said. By the way, Billy also pushed the RSV. He also pushed that, that Alexandrian text and that modern perversion that went everywhere. His evangelistic association pushed that everywhere. The Bible says very clearly, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Listen to what he did. Graham stressed that in his crusade in Pittsburgh would be interdenominational. He said that he hopes to hear Bishop Fulton Sheen at one of the masses of St. Paul's Cathedral tomorrow. As already noted, Sheen was a staunch Romanist and a great lover of the Catholic Mary. Many of the people, Billy Graham said, many of the people who have reached a decision on Christ at our meetings have joined the Catholic Church, and we have received commendations from Catholic publications for the revived interest in the Church following one of our campaigns. This happened both in Boston and Washington. After all, one of our prime purposes is to help the churches in the community. If after we move on to the local and attendance in our crusades, would it be considered a failure? He was, basically, he was saying that if, you know, if we don't push people back to Rome, he calls Rome a church. He calls Rome a church just like the, we're all the same. We're all just churches. It's not true. There is a difference, and Rome is, a, Rome is the occult. Rome is the, is, the, is the mother of all harlots. She is the great whore that sits on, on, the, on seven hills. 
Amen. And her doctrine is dirty. It's not clean. Listen to what he says here. I have some difficulty in accepting the indiscriminate baptism of infants without a careful regard as to whether the parents have any intention of fulfilling the promise they make. But I do believe that something happens at the baptism of an infant. Particularly if the parents are Christian and teach their children Christian truths from childhood. We cannot fully understand the miracles of God, but I believe that a miracle can happen in these children so that they are regenerated. That is, made Christian through infant baptism. Did you hear that? Yeah. If you want to, listen to what he says, if you want to call that baptismal regeneration, that's all right with me. Why do you think that I've had Hundreds or maybe, 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 I don't even know how many, 50 or 60 or 70, 100, I don't know how many emails, lots of emails on Duck Dynasty. And why do you think that I had so many people that missed the point altogether? These guys are preaching baptismal regeneration and they're just getting it. Why? Because of Billy. That's why. Because Billy merged it all together and paved the way. Where now everybody in society that says Jesus is automatically a Christian. Right, because we don't baptize our our children, our infants, and our children. Right. He says here, let's see. He says here, nor was the fault always on the Catholic side when he got into a big when he went to Latin America. He said, oftentimes in Latin American Protestants were guilty of intolerance, negative preaching, and inflammatory language. That'd be me, negative preaching, inflammatory language. I, I'm guilty, and I, I don't have a problem with that either, by the way especially concerning Rome and their damnable heresies. Amen. I had no intentions of adding fuel to the fire, he said. In fact, whenever possible during our trips south as well as on other tours, I tried to meet with local Catholic leaders to the occasional consternation of some of our hosts. My goal, I always made clear, was not to preach against Catholic beliefs or to proselytize people who were already committed to Christ within the Catholic Church. How could any Baptist like this man? It makes me sick just even saying it. By 1962, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association edited the Haley Bible Commentary, subtitled the Pocket Bible Handbook, to remove references to Rome's murderous inquisition. The BGEA organization acquired the printing rights of the book, but was not supposed to change it. Pastor Jimmy Robbins of Cowper, South Carolina, told me that Henry Halley's widow was upset at the way the Graham organization changed her husband's work by removing pages 676 to 705, which had described the martyrdom of millions throughout the Papal Inquisition. Rewrite history, just erase it so it's not there, it's not real. Billy Graham gave an inspiring and theological sound address that may have been given by Fulton Sheen or any other Catholic preacher. That's what they said to him when he went to the Catholic University. I have followed Billy Graham's career, and I must emphasize that he has been more Catholic than otherwise. And I say this not in a partisan manner, but as a matter of fact. This is a Catholic bishop saying this about Billy Graham. How would you like to be a Baptist preacher and have a Catholic tell you that your sermon sounded Catholic? <laughs> In May of 1966, Graham made this statement, I find myself closer to the Catholics than the radical Protestants. I can't make this stuff up, man. I think the Roman Catholic Church today is going through a second reformation. On Larry King Live, aired April 2nd, 2005, Billy Graham said the, said the late Pope John Paul II was the most influential voice of morality and peace in the world in the last 100 years. When Larry King asked, there is no question in your mind that he is with God now, Graham replied, oh no, there may be a question about my own. He said, there may be a question about my salvation. How did anybody follow this guy? I'm just shocked. He said, I don't know, I'm sure about the Pope. Graham replied, oh no, there may be a question about my own, but I don't think 
uh, the Pope, I, I mean, I think he's with the Lord because he believed. He believed in the cross. That was his focus throughout his ministry, the cross. No matter if you were talking to him from a personal issue or ethical problem, he felt that there was the answer to all our problems, the cross and the resurrection. He was a strong believer. What cross, Billy? Which one? Which cross? But you see, these people have paved the way for men like Joel Olstein to have such a strong influence on people today. Such a powerful, and Rick Warren, a powerful influence. This is a most amazing statement by the man who is considered the world's most foremost evangelist and the most prominent voice of evangelical Christianity. Graham expresses less than certainty about his own salvation, but complete certainty about the Pope's. Even though he preached a false gospel of grace mixed with works and sacraments and put his trust in Mary as his intercessor. Graham should know that John Paul II did not believe in the cross in any scriptural sense. Rather, he believed in the cross plus baptism plus mass plus confession to a priest plus the saints and above all plus Mary. The late Pope believed that the doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through Christ alone, by faith alone, is heresy. That's what he said. The anathemas of the Council of Trent against the gospel of grace alone have never been rescinded. He believed that the sacraments are a necessary part of salvation, beginning with baptism, whereby one is born again, continuing in confirmation, whereby one receives the Holy Spirit. Speaking at the confirmation of 800 young people in Italy on September 2nd, 1988, Pope John Paul II said this, Jesus comes close to us. He enters our history precisely by means of these concrete, visible sacramental signs. Confirmation is your personal Pentecost. Where do you find that in Scripture? Today you, oh, I forgot, they don't believe in that. Today you receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, who on the day of Pentecost was sent by the risen Lord upon the apostles. Every baptized person as a believer needs to, be, needs to receive the moment and mystery of Pentecost. It completes and perfects the gift of baptism. Nine days later speaking, John Paul II said to the crowd gathered at the park, You have thus become a new people, reborn in the sacrament of baptism, nourished by the Holy Eucharist, living in loving communion with God and with one another, with the successor Peter and the Catholic Church throughout the world. You see, Billy didn't believe the Bible. He didn't. He didn't believe the scriptures as they were written. He didn't believe the gospel. He believed the gospel of Rome. That was what he believed. By the way, a little bit more on, on his Jesuit connection here. Graham's surrender is unequivocally clear when he surrendered to Rome. It was November 1967 when he received his honorary degree from a Jesuit school, Belmont Abbey, of that wicked system which has slain millions of God's people in a system of spiritual darkness. Graham made his incredible statement, the gospel that built this school, he was speaking of a Catholic school, the gospel that built this school and the gospel that brings me here tonight is still the way, of sal way to salvation. Really? Graham was definitely controlled by the Knights of Malta, and he was controlled by Jesuits. These others were Knights of Malta. They were all mixed in, mixed in together. You see, that's what the desire is. Why do you think he said this? In, in, why do you think he said the Spirit speaketh expressly? Why do you think he said that certain men would crept in unawares? They, they've crept in and they've started teaching other doctrines. Why do you think he told young Timothy 17 times in, the, in Titus, doctrine, 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 why? Because he said that they would come in and they would preach doctrines of devils. And that's exactly what they've done. And that's exactly what Billy Graham has done. Billy Graham did not preach the word of God. He did not preach the gospel. If you go online, you can see some of these same things yourself, and you will understand that all he was was a prophet of a new world church. By the way, he was yoked up with the One World Council, of the World Council of Churches. He was yoked up with the Vatican. If you read the Vatican too, you will understand exactly what Billy Graham believed and he followed and he was into, exactly how he followed Roman Catholicism. What kind of a Baptist preacher of any sort would not stand up against Roman Catholicism? 
how in the world does a Baptist become friends with the Pope? What type of conversation could you have with a devil? Turn to Galatians quickly here, and then we'll be done. Do you believe you have to take a sacrament to be saved? Do you believe that you have to take the, the, the Holy Eucharist and have, and have baptism to be saved? By the way, it's not holy. I'm just paraphrasing there, that using their words. But do, do you believe they have to, that you have to do that? Do you believe that the church, that salvation lies in the church? Because that's the gospel that Rome preaches. That gospel is found in Galatians chapter 1. In verse number 6, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Billy Graham was more concerned with pleasing the masses and pleasing Rome and yoking up to Rome so he could have a worldwide coverage. That was his goal, and that's what he did. And that was Rome's goal, to use him to bridge, bridge a gap that is there. And now you see all the Protestant churches, many of them, even the Baptists now, Baptist churches that are now coming back to Rome. They never, the true Baptists were never a part of Rome, but these people have apostatized and they've gone into Rome as if they're Protestants, and they probably are anyway, they're probably not Baptists anyway, but, but they're, they're going back to Rome. They're going to that harlot. They're going to that false gospel. Now, how could anybody back Billy Graham or support anything that man does? How could anybody say he's a good man or he was a good prophet or he preached good Bible or anything else, knowing what he did and how he did it and how he worked with Rome and did all those things? Do you preach the gospel of Rome? No. Do you preach the gospel of Mary? No. Do you preach those sacraments as salvation? No. Can you get saved outside of church? Yes. What saves you? The cross of Jesus Christ, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus Christ is the only way. That is not what Rome believes. Rome believes that the church is equal with the Bible. They do not believe the Bible is the inerrant, perfect, inspired, infallible word of God. They believe that they can add to it, and they do. And Billy Graham linked up to them, and he's a prophet of the new order. I know that's kind of a historical one, so it doesn't hit it. Billy Graham for this generation right here won't hit that, that close to home. But as we continue and look at some of these other men that have a worldwide outreach now, they do affect people you know, and they will affect people you know. Men like Rick Warren and, Bill, and, uh, and uh, Joel Osteen and men like that that have a, lot, have a strong grip, but what do they preach? Do they preach the gospel of the Bible? No. Do they? No, they don't, sadly. They preach a new age gospel, another gospel that is supposed to be a curse. And it used to be that Baptists would stand up and make that dividing line and be like, you know what? No, the Pope, that's, he's a devil. He is a picture of the Antichrist. He is the false prophet. And Jesus said that, 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 that the, the gate is not wide, it's narrow. He said straight is the gate and narrow is the way. But how would you like to, how would you like to go to a, a Billy Graham evangelistic meeting like that and have Roman Catholic priests there, Jewish rabbis there, and say, well, we don't want we we're going to give all the decision cards back to the Roman. Do you think that that person actually got saved if they want to go back to Rome and hang out there? Do you think that Catholic father that is there is is a born again Bible believing person? So why would a man 
Doesn't that strikingly sound new world order to you and new, new age agenda for a man to stand up and have Roman Catholics say, well, anybody that's a Catholic here, we're going to send you back to your Catholic church. Why would you send them back to hell? What is that? That's antinomianism. It's to say that nothing changes with your life, that God doesn't have a perfect law in his book, and, the, and, the, and that he won't write the law of his law in your heart, and you won't be a different creature when you get saved. That's the gospel of Billy Graham, that everything pretty much stays the same. When he was, And I'm going to close with this. When he was at uh, that 9-11 ceremony in Washington, when he was at that 9-11 ceremony, the National Cathedral, he came in there, and there were Muslims, and there were, you know, I mean, man, there were wizards and warlocks. I think everybody was in that there, there that day. It was everybody. And anyway, so they were sitting up there, and he was preaching, so to speak, and he started to say, and he said, he said, now for the Christian, the cross is our deliverance for the Christian. He kept saying that over and over again. Not the Muslim, not for the, listen, is that how you preach to Muslims? Is that how you preach to people that for the Christian... The cross is deliverance. For you, though, you go back to your God. Because that's what he said. That's what he was saying. The cross for the Christian. He, didn't, he wouldn't come out and preach straight. Why? Because he doesn't believe the Bible. That's why. And he was a liar from the beginning. He is a liar. And he was a deceiver. And there are many false prophets that come out. And many deceive. What did we learn about that in 1 John? What did he, what did he say to him? He said, there shall arise many false prophets. In Matthew chapter 24, there shall arise many false Christs and many false prophets, and they shall deceive many. That's the promise. It's coming. And it's here. We see it. And Paul said, the Spirit speaketh expressly, he said they're, they're going to preach doctrines of devils. Billy Graham was ne never did believe the Bible. It wasn't real to him. He said the flames of hell are, are, are figurative because he cannot imagine God allowing you to burn in hell for all of eternity. So they're figurative. It's just separation from God. That's what he says hell is. It's just separation from God. That's nothing but rank heresy. And it's a lie. And we need to be understand, as we lay this foundation again, you're going to see how the, these same teachings move on to the next generation. And there's got to be men in every generation who stand up and preach against it. They've got to warn people. One of the jobs of a pastor, one of his main jobs of a shepherd is to warn. Warn the flock. Yes, you feed the flock of God and you warn the flock. You warn them of false teachers. You warn them of wolves in sheep's clothing. You'd be shocked to know the people that follow these teachings. You'd be shocked to know the fundamentalists. I've heard them. They said, well, Billy's not that bad. He, was, he wasn't that bad. He, he used to preach pretty good. Billy was two-faced his whole life. You can prove that by the dates, and in his biography, he admits it. He says, he goes back to the years before, and he says, well, back in 1957, I did this, and I did that, and... He admits it. He admits that he was doing it the whole time. He was talking to fundamentals. In fact, uh, R.T. Ketchum, Robert Ketchum of the of the, uh, the Baptist Association, uh, the General Baptist uh, General uh, GRBC, sorry, GARBC uh, conference. He asked Billy. He sent a message to Billy's secretary. He says, "Hey, are you guys sending these people back to Rome and back to?" And they said, "Well, that's absurd. You, you, that question is absurd that you would even ask." But in Billy's writings, he admits it, that he, in his own biography, admits that, yes, he was doing that. He was lying to them. You can see it clearly in his writings. He was lying to that preacher. He was lying to Bob Jones. He lied to all of them. Why? Because he was a liar. And he is a liar. That's why. And there are many false prophets like that. Father, thank you so much for the truth of the Word of God. Thank you that it's real. Thank you that we can hold it, Lord. We know that all truth doesn't come from this preacher right here. It comes from this book, the King James Bible, the Word of the Living God. These are the words of life, Lord. We don't find it in a sermon. We find it here. And we test everything that's preached to us from this book. And we try the spirits, for there are many 
antichrists, Billy Graham being one of them, yoking with Rome. Lord, Lord, I pray, let that be accursed. Let it be accursed like you said in your word. And let it be shown to be what it really is, a false gospel and a lie from the pit of hell. Help us, Lord, to warn. Help us, Lord, to warn our friends, to tell our, our, our families. Help us to preach a real Bible faith found in the Scriptures, not a gospel and a doctrine of devils. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.